Hello, I'm Dr. Hassan Tawheed once again with a very important topic, understanding scoping reviews. Understanding scoping reviews. Today in this video, we will understand the idea, the concept, and the logic behind scoping reviews. We have discussed meta-analysis, we have discussed systematic review, but we have not discussed scoping review enough and many students want to learn what is the idea behind scoping reviews. How do they differentiate scoping reviews from other kinds of reviews? So let's begin. As we already know that a review article is a combination of so many papers you combine many papers and you write one paper out of it everyone understands this right if you have been following me and you have been watching my videos then you don't have any difficulty understanding this idea or this concept now the literature review or the traditional review is the most commonly written review article right among the students i would say traditional review or the literature review is written without any checklist without any guidelines Inclusion exclusion criteria is optional and no quality appraisal or assessment is done. But in the scoping review, what do we actually do? In the scoping review, we follow certain checklists or guidelines, just like in a systematic review. What was a checklist if you remember? P-R-I-S-M-A, Prisma checklist for systematic review, right? And meta-analysis. PRISMA stands for Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. The same PRISMA for scoping reviews is also available. PRISMA for scoping reviews. If you are planning to write a scoping review, you will follow PRISMA for scoping reviews. But now what is the difference? Remember, systematic review is narrowed. The question is focused. But in scoping review, the question is broad. Because in systematic review, we are actually answering a question, a narrowed, a focused question. But here in scoping review, we are not. We are not doing it. What are we actually doing? We are actually looking at how much, how much data is already available. What has been written? What kinds of studies are written? What kinds of studies are available? What kinds of studies are published? What kind of literature is available? How much has been done? So naturally, the scoping review will be not focused, will be broad. Systematic review will be focused, will be narrowed down. The question will be focused to the PICO question. But here in scoping review, the question is not that focused. Usually we use the PCC question the population, the concept, and the context. This is usually the PCC question uh, mod model of scoping review. Now the question is, why do we do that? Because it is actually a precursor to a systematic review. We want to see how much data is available. We write a scoping review, and then we decide, okay, can we do a systematic review of this? Now, let me tell you why. Systematic review is tough. We have to be very focused. We don't include all the studies available. We include limited studies because we conduct a quality appraisal of the studies that we have included. But in scoping reviews, we don't need to have quality appraisal because we want to include as many articles as possible because we want to see how much is available. In systematic reviews, we are looking at what is the quality of articles? What is the quality of data that is available? That's a systematic review. But in scoping review, we are looking at how much is available. So we include as many articles as possible. That's why we have a broad question. I hope now this makes sense that the difference is in scoping review, we are looking at all possible data, whatever we can find, published and unpublished. In systematic review, we also include published and unpublished, but we are just including good quality studies. That's why in scoping reviews, we don't check the quality. It's optional. If you want to check quality of all the articles that you have included and you still want to exclude some useless articles, that's fine. You can do that. But it is not a mandatory requirement to, to do quality appraisal in the scoping review as much as it is needed in the systematic review. So let's repeat once again. We have three kinds of articles. Literature review, then systematic review, and the scoping review. We understand this, right? Literature review, no checklist, no guidelines. 
Inclusion exclusion criteria is optional and in literature review, no quality appraisal is needed. In systematic review, Prisma checklist for systematic reviews, of course, preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis, the same will, will be used for meta-analysis. And inclusion exclusion criteria is used, a, a question is used, a research question, a narrow research question is used. And what else is used? The quality appraisal tools, the quality appraisal checklist to check the quality of the articles, to make sure we include good quality articles. But in scoping review, what do we do in the scoping review? In the scoping review, we have a research question, but it will be broad. We have the checklist Prisma for scoping review. We will have the inclusion exclusion criteria, but the quality appraisal, the quality check is optional. We don't have to do it because we want to add as many articles as possible because in systematic reviews, we are making sure we include quality studies. But in, in the scoping review, we are focusing on the quantity. We want to make sure all kinds of articles are included because we want to see what has been done so far because the scoping review will become a systematic review later. It is a precursor of systematic review. I hope you enjoyed this video. Watch this video again. And if you have any question, please do comment below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And thank you for watching. Keep learning. Keep watching.